Good evening and welcome to another prayer meeting with Cottondale. Hope you're having a good week so far. Um, we finished up the book of Daniel last time and so that was quite a journey. I hope that was helpful and beneficial to you and um, if it was feel free to share that with others so they can be blessed as well. Um, before I jump into another book, if I'm going to do that, I'm not sure yet. But we're going to do kind of a, a little bit of a standalone um, kind of study this evening. And we're going to talk about what is one of my favorite psalms that I've talked about before. Uh, that has just been such a blessing to me. And I believe will be a blessing to you as well. And that is Psalm 25. Psalm 25. And so, uh, before we dive in, why not just uh, pull out your Bible and turn to Psalm 25, and you can uh, hit the pause button and go ahead and take as much time as you need to read through that entire psalm. And when you're done, we'll be ready to jump ahead, and then uh, so you can pick back up with me then. All right, and so what we're going to do tonight is we're going to divide up this psalm into uh, kind of topically. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. What we're going to do is we're going to divide up this psalm topically. And so as I was reading over and reflecting on this psalm a little bit, it seemed that there were there were three kind of um, main uh, topics or issues or ideas or themes, maybe is probably the best word. Three kinds of themes, three different themes that kind of kept recurring throughout the psalm, you know, kind of interspersed throughout there. And so we can kind of draw out some individual verses um, from the psalm that highlight each of the three themes. And so that's what I want to do. This evening, and whatever we learn from those, we can make it our prayer to God. The first theme, and and what has been one of the most important aspects of this psalm to me, uh, is the theme of God's gracious guidance in our lives. Let's just look at a couple of verses that um that talk about that. It says, "Make me to know your ways, O Lord, and teach me." And uh, teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Verse 8 Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. For those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. Okay. So let's just kind of walk through uh, each of these a little bit tonight. So the first one says, verse 4 there, make me to know your ways, O Lord. Um, teach me, teach me your paths. And so uh, this uh, in your Bible, it probably says that it's of David. Um, so that means the ancient tradition says that David wrote this psalm. We're not 100% sure that those um, uh, ascriptions are always accurate, but um, but it's traditionally been ascripted to David. Okay, and uh, this is, I believe, a great... Verse 4 here is a great model prayer for us and sets up kind of the theme throughout the rest of the psalm. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. The Lord... It's the Lord's ways, okay? And the, the Lord has ways, <laughs> right? His ways aren't always our ways, right? The, but the Lord has ways. But if we know the Lord, right? If we trust the Lord, if we believe uh, that the Lord knows better than, than I do, and than, than we do, we're, we're going to be people who really want to know the Lord's ways, not just my ways. I want to know the Lord's ways, so what Lord, what are your ways? It's not sometimes it's not always clear, is it? Maybe you're faced with a decision in life and you're just not sure what path to take. Well, what a great prayer. Lord, 
teach me your paths, teach me your ways. Okay? Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. And so, so the ways of the Lord now is um, described as what? As the Lord's truth. Okay? So, following God's ways is the same thing as listening to God's truth, right? He actually says, lead me in your truth. So, there is a, there's, a, there's a true way, right? There's a true path that aligns with God and His will that we should seek to walk down because... God is good, and He's kind, and He's merciful, and He leads us down good paths, okay? This is very contrary, right, to the world, right, that many people want to say today, well, there's all kinds of ways. There's more than one way, you know, for this or that and everything, especially religion. You know, every way is the right way in some sense, people say, but that's not really what's being said here, is it? There is a way that David doesn't know, okay, and he doesn't presume to know it, and so God is the one who has to tell him what is the way, and then he wants to be led in that way, in that truth. And he wants to be taught in that way, in that truth. It's something, it's not innate, right? We don't know innately what God, what God's ways and his paths are. We have to be taught. We have to learn from God, from his word, from his scriptures, uh, from the prophets and so on, the Old Testament writings. And guess what? This is a prayer. So you can do what? You can pray the same thing that David prayed to God, that God would lead you and teach you his ways. And he, he will. And this is what he says. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. And so in other words, this the way it's translated here, he's given a reason that he's asking God to lead him and teach him. The reason is because God God is the God of his salvation, right? God is trustworthy. God delivers. God saves. He's, as we'll learn in a little bit here, the psalm reflects probably a season in his life where um, he really needs some help. He really needs some deliverance. He really needs some direction in his life, and a misstep, right, going in the wrong direction could cost him dearly, right? And so, and so he does. And so, in such a dire situation, he doesn't just want. Uh, he doesn't just want to know whatever he thinks. He wants to know what God thinks, because God, because the Lord is the God of his salvation. He's the one that David trusts to save him and deliver him. He says, "For you, I wait all the day long." And so there it is again. You know, you ever get ahead of God? <laughs> I always think about Joshua. Remember that story in Joshua where they entered into the promised land and one of these peoples that, um, these idolatrous people that they were supposed to destroy heard that they were coming and um, and they, they dressed in ragged clothes and took stale bread and walked over to the Israelites and made it look like that they were from far away, saying they had traveled a far way, and that they wanted to make a covenant of peace with Israel so that they wouldn't be destroyed. And of course they were lying and they were tricking the Israelites. But there's a little line in there, if you remember, where it says that Joshua and the other people, that they did not consult the Lord. They did not consult the Lord. And then because of that, they made a covenant with the people and uh, like like they weren't like they weren't supposed to, they were tricked. So sometimes we can get ahead of God, but if we know that He is the God of our salvation, then then maybe we're in a situation where we really need Him to lead us in truth, where we really need Him to teach us. But sometimes that's not automatic. Sometimes we might just have to wait on that direction, right? Sometimes we might just sometimes we just have to be quiet enough to listen and to wait. But the, the thing is, is that because he's the God of our salvation, right, then he's worth waiting on, right? We can, we can wait on him. His, he'll be on time. We don't, want to get, we don't want to get ahead of him because he's the God of our salvation. He's the only one that can save us. He's the only one that can make whatever situation you're in in life work out the way it needs to. And if that requires waiting on him for that to happen, then we'll trust him, won't we? 
Then it says, good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. I love this right here because, because I don't know about you, but I, I just, I'm keenly aware that this is what I am. You ever feel that way? You just say, man, that's me right there. And just sometimes you just think, you know, man, you know, I, you know, I'm just not, I'm not, I just don't feel like I'm who I'm, I'm not fully who I'm supposed to be and how, why should I expect God to show me the way or the direction or that my life should take or the, the way I should choose in this particular decision that I'm weighing? You know, why should I, I'm a sinner, you know, why should I, why should God, you know, why should God help me, you know, in that as many times as I have failed him? But notice, notice what David says here. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. So the reason why God will instruct sinners, <laughs> he doesn't instruct them because they're sinners, right? He, he instructs sinners not because they're sinners. He instructs them because he is good. <laughs> in other words, God helps his people. He helps those who look to him despite our sin. He helps those who trust him despite our weakness. He helps us not because we're good, but because he's good. Right? And this verse is just so powerful. I mean, I, you know, I would encourage you to memorize it, you know, because it's just such a great encouragement to just know that it's like, hey, I don't deserve it, but you know what? It's not about what I deserve. God is good. God is upright. God does what is right. And because God is good, He's going to help me even though I don't deserve it. As long as I look to Him and trust in Him, He's going to help me. And, and, he, and He instructs us, right? He instructs you. He will teach you. Sometimes you just, you might think, you know, you know, how can I, you know, how can... How will I know, you know, what to do? Or I don't know what to do. But he says, he says, he instructs sinners. That's what God does. You want to know what God wants you to do? It may not be a sign from, probably won't be a sign from heaven. You probably have to open your Bible to find it. It probably won't be a voice that you hear in the back of your head. But, you know, if you seek him and listen and read his word and are attentive to his spirit and trust him, he will tell you. He will. He he is in the business of instructing sinners in the way. He will show you the way that you should go. I love this verse too. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. And so now David is beginning to talk about the condition of our heart. Right? There's a humility required in even turning to God. Right? Prayerless for you know uh, somebody once said prayerlessness is pride right prayerlessness is pride right because when you when you stop praying that you stop praying because why because whether you really think about it or not you stop praying because you stop thinking i need i need god's help i could just do it on my own we when we think we can do it on our own we don't pray right prayerlessness is pride but when you're humble there's there's a certain amount of humility that will even pray in the first place right because to pray means it is to acknowledge I need God. But if you humble yourself, he's going to do what? He's going to lead you in what is right. It doesn't say what is easy, right? He doesn't say what is easy. He said he's going to lead you in what is right. And that's a, there's a, there's sometimes there's a big difference between the two. But look, if you trust God, this is what you're going to care about. Right isn't always easy, but if you want to know what's right, God will help you if you do this. And he'll teach you his way. If you're this, right? And so we see that our God is good, so he's going to instruct sinners in the way, not because of our goodness, but because of his goodness. But there is a con- there is there is a condition on our part. It's not a it's not a big condition. It's just a it's just the condition of the heart that says, God help me, <laughs> right? If you if you can muster up enough humility to say, God, I need your help. Doesn't matter what you've did done. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. That's. It's just like because it's just like faith. It's just like becoming a Christian. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter for how long you've done it. It's never too late to do this. And if you do this, God will do this. God will do this. 
And then verse 10 here, all the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimony. And so all the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. And so, um, you know, I'm not, you know, I could, I could be wrong on the way that I'm reading this, but the way that I read it is something like this. That all the paths of the Lord, that is, all the directions the Lord leads us down, right? All the paths that He causes our life to take, and that He'll lead us to take as we trust in Him. All of those paths are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep His covenants and His testimonies, okay? So sometimes you may be being, you may be led down a path and you seek the Lord and you really feel like you are seeking the Lord. And you go down this path in your life, and maybe it turns out a lot harder than you expected. Maybe it takes a turn that you you feel like is really bad and not good. What this verse says is, no, no, no. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. You might not see how this path that God set you on is good. You might say, I wish God set me on a different path. I wish God put someone else on this path. Well, the Bible says all the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. Okay? So, it means what? It means you got to trust Him. It means sometimes it might not be obvious, but if you trust Him, whatever path you're on, if you've trusted Him, you can trust that you're on the right path. It might, be, not, might not be an easy path, but it's the right path. If you have trusted him, your path is steadfast love and faithfulness from God. And that's where that's trusting in, who keeps his covenant and his testimonies. This is how you know. Okay, This is how you know. Now, that's, now it's a different story if you look back and you say, well, I wasn't really trusting the Lord then. And now look at the situation I'm in. Okay, If you, wasn't, if you weren't keeping his covenant and his testimonies, well, you might can look back and say, okay, I got myself in this mess. You know, sometimes a hard situation is that God's way, sometimes it is God's way of saying, you messed up. You need to humble yourself and come back to me. But, but, if you've trusted in Him, and you've hoped in Him, and you've humbled yourself and you've sought Him, well, guess what? You might still end up in a very difficult situation in life. But, if you have done this, right, then you can know then you can know, hey, it's not because God's not trying to punish me here. Some people really struggle with that. If you've trusted the Lord, hey, God's not trying to punish you. All his paths are steadfast love and faithfulness to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. Okay, so some prayer points here. Um, what direction is your life committed to right now? What, what path are you headed down? Okay, just re- think about that. Sometimes we don't think about that everyone's life is headed in some direction. What di- what direction is yours headed in right now? Is it the right one? And how do you know? Sometimes it's good to just hit the pause button on life and say, where am I going in life? What, you know, what, 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 what am I even trying to do, right? Sometimes we don't even think about that. It's a great time to reflect and, and seek the Lord's guidance, not just your plans, but God's plans. And the next here, and this is really important, what's a specific concern you need guidance from the Lord right now? I have no doubt that there's somebody watching this video right now, and you just, you, maybe you're faced with some kind of decision, you know, I don't know, but you really need guidance from the Lord. And in God's kindness, He has connected you to His Word through Psalm 25, and we've just read over these promises from God, and now you can have confidence. And so now you can look back over the promises, the verses we read a little bit earlier, Psalm 25, they're opening your Bible. Go and, you know, I'm not a name it and claim it kind of guy, but when it comes to stuff like this, you can name it and claim it. When God says he leads the humble in what is right and when he and He teaches the humble his way, that's what God says. So you can, you can claim that. You humble yourself before God. He's going to lead you. He's going to teach you. And so claim that promise. Pray it back to God. And ask for guidance in whatever you're dealing with. And I really believe as you wait on him, he'll show you the way. Go ahead and hit the pause button and work through this. And join back with me when you're done. 
All right, we're going to jump to the next theme uh, here. And uh, this next theme is about the distress and the opposition that David faced as a as someone who trusted in God. Okay, he says, "O oh God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous." Verse 19, "Consider how many are my foes and with what violent hatred they hate me. O oh, guard my soul." And deliver me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. Okay. So let's just talk about these a little bit. Another theme of this psalm is God trusting David. We, I mentioned a little bit earlier that it seems David is in a situation where, you know, people are opposing him for trusting in the Lord. We know for a fact, for example, that David trusted God, and Saul, King Saul, tried to kill him, was literally chasing him like a madman all over the nation of Israel trying to kill him, this guy who hadn't done anything bad for him, uh, bad against him, and in fact was his, one of his best soldiers and uh, was married to his daughter, okay? So Saul just went crazy in his sin, Okay, and, and David, at one point, you remember, had an opportunity to kill Saul. You know, if someone was trying to kill me, and I had a clear opportunity to take him out, I don't know about you, but I'd be tempted to do that. David had a clear opportunity to take out Saul, who was going like a madman trying to kill him, and he refused to do it because he trusted in the Lord, and he, wouldn't, he would do things the Lord's way, which meant not eat, which meant not taking vengeance on God's anointed, okay, uh, the king. And so, in other words, God, David trusted the Lord rather than do what would have just seemed expedient, right? And so, this is really kind of a similar situation uh, expressed in David's uh, prayer here, or psalm here. He says, oh my God, in you I trust, right? David had to trust the Lord. So, then he says, let me not be put to shame, let my... Let not my enemies exult over me, right? So what's the temptation in life? The temptation is if people play, if, if other people seem to be playing dirty, you know, not following the rules, then guess what? If, I gotta keep, if I'm going to keep up or keep people from taking advantage of me, then guess what? I got to do the same thing, right? I got to cheat. I got to not play by the rules, right? That's the temptation. But if you trust God, then guess what? You're not going to do that. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to do the right thing even if everyone else isn't. And then, but when you do that, even from a from a humanly perspective, when you trust God rather than than just be pragmatic and be expedient, doing whatever you think is going to help you at the moment, you trust God instead. Well, humanly speaking, it's going to seem to put you at a disadvantage, right? You're saying, well, they're over there scheming and doing whatever, and I'm not going to act like that because it's not right. But they're going to get an advantage because of all that, because of the wrong that they're willing to do that I'm not willing to do. Well, guess what? We're not the first one to have those thoughts, but David prays this prayer. I trust in you, God, so guess what? So then he prays what? Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. You see, this is one of the key themes of the Bible, and that is you trust the Lord, and guess what? Let God take care of the results. You know, people, you know, the Bible talks a lot about how, you know, sometimes it seems the wicked prosper, and sometimes that they do up to a certain point, <laughs> but there's a point at which only the righteous prosper, and that is at the day of judgment. And so guess what? We can trust God, and God isn't going to let us be put to shame. That We might be put to shame in this world, and we might be thought of as the scum of the earth, but guess what? It's only temporary. God will not, in the end, let those who opposed him and his word exult over his people. It just won't happen. When you trust in the Lord, God is going to work it out. So guess what? That means you can do what's, what's right even when it's hard. Even when there's great temptation not to do so because God's going to fight for you. So you don't have to fight for yourself. He said, indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. Look at that right there. You, you worry, Lord, I got, I got to cut this corner to survive. I got to cut this corner to make it. Mm, no, you don't. None who wait for God will be put to shame. You don't have to do it. You don't have to do it. God will fight for you if you wait for Him. 
you trust them. But if you are wantonly treacherous, that means if you do you do whatever you want to do, you do the wrong thing and you know that you're doing it and you do it on purpose to to get ahead or whatever it is in life. It's not an if. It's a will. That's going to happen. God will put those to shame who didn't trust in Him. Who did what they knew was not right to do out of expediency or whatever. Ends justify the means kind of thing. It's very common perspective in our world today but it's not it, it, it can't be said of those who follow christ if you do that you will be this but none who wait for the lord shall be put to shame you can bank on that okay consider how many are my foes with what violent hatred they hate me so he had many enemies oh guard my soul and deliver me let me not be put to shame for i take refuge in you so you can pray because we're not going to we're not going to cheat or do whatever to deliver ourselves. So guess what? We pray to God. God for, to deliver us. And He will. But you got to do this. you got to take refuge in the Lord. Don't take refuge in your wisdom, in your skill, in your strength, in your plans, in your schemes. You take refuge in the Lord. And He'll make sure you won't be put to shame. Okay? So... By means of prayer here, everyone living a godly life faces spiritual opposition of some sort. It's just reality. If you live a godly life, you're going to face some kind of spiritual opposition. People are just not going to like it. They're not going to like the stands that you take, the opinion, you know, the the positions that you hold because you trust in God, and that'll become increasingly true in the coming days when our worldview as Christians becomes increasingly unthinkable to uh, a world who just. Um, just comes at it from a very different perspective, to put it as simply as possible, okay? And there will be opposition because of that. And maybe you have experienced some opposition in your life right now for holding firm to the truth and doing the right thing. Maybe it's in your job. Maybe it's in your family. Maybe there's tension in your family because, you know, you're clinging to the truth of God. I mean, there's all kinds of things, you know, We're honoring God will cause tension and opposition, just like happened with David. Well, guess what? You can commit that to God, and He will act. And so, you know, if you can't think of a specific example in your personal life, well, then you can certainly pray then for um, the church here in America uh, and all around the world um, that God will, because obviously, I mean, very clearly in uh, the the United States at least. We will and face. We are and will face increasing opposition to our beliefs, and so pray that God will commit that to the Lord, and we can know that God will help us and God will act. So take some time and pray through these, and uh, pick back up with me when you're done. Okay, got one more theme, and this is the theme of forgiveness of sin. David says, "Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old." Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Okay. So we'll just kind of walk through this quickly here. Another theme in this psalm, which is very important and key part of the theme, is that he, he asked for God's mercy, okay? His steadfast love is God who's merciful. It's God who has steadfast love. David doesn't think that he deserves it. <laughs> he just knows he needs God's mercy. And so he says, God, when you remember me, remember this. Remember your mercy too, <laughs> right? I think most of us can relate to that. So he praises God. God, you're merciful. You're loving. From of old, you have been this way. You've always been this way, God. So be this way for me too. Don't remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. Man, you have anything you regret in the past? Your youth? Or just not that long ago maybe for some of us? Well, we it's never too late to repent and say, God, don't remember that. <laughs> Please don't remember that, Lord. You know, that's what God, that's what David is saying. And that, it's a great prayer to pray. God is merciful if we'll ask him and, and repent of our sins. He's merciful. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Again, 
his love, according to his love, according to his goodness, right? We don't, we don't presume we have any basis to ask for God's mercy, but we do have, we only, there's only one basis and that is not us, but it's, it's not in us, but it's in God because God is loving. We can ask for mercy because God is good. We can ask for mercy, and that's the the only basis with which we ask. There it is again, for your namesake, not for me, Lord, for your namesake, part of my guilt, for it is great, right? Consider my affliction and trouble and forgive all my sins. And so I just want to comment here and say David can only have confidence before God because he has pled with him for mercy. He doesn't he's not he doesn't have confidence in himself. He only can have confidence in his bold prayers to God because he has confidence that God is a merciful God, that God won't count his sins against him, but that he'll remember him according to his steadfast love and not according to David's sins. Only a forgiven and upright heart can expect anything from the Lord, right? If we, if we, if we don't acknowledge our sins, if we don't confess our sins, if we don't come and ask God humbly to forgive us of our sins and really mean it and really desire in our heart to turn away from those sins and not repeat those sins over and over and over with an unrepentant heart, if we really come to God with a humble, contrite, broken heart asking for forgiveness, then He will. And then, and when we have forgive the Lord's forgiveness, then we can do what? We can have great boldness when we pray, right? Because we know that there's nothing, sin is like a wall between us and God. Forgiveness wipes away that wall so that we have access to God. But if we have unconfessed sin in our life, we know that there's a wall there. That's why if there's a sin in our life, the first thing that goes is our prayer life. If you have some kind of unconfessed, unrepented sin in your life, even as a Christian, the first thing that goes is your prayer life. Because you just don't want to talk to God. And when your prayer life goes, everything else is going to go. <laughs> because you're just relying on yourself. Okay, But you can come to the Lord and ask Him for forgiveness. And God, through Jesus Christ, will tear that wall down. And then you can ask God, even as a sinner, you can ask Him boldly. Because God has forgiven you through Jesus Christ. So now is a great time to confess any known sin. Ask God for clean hands and a pure heart. That's a Psalm 51. Right? And then you can pray boldly, and then you can know that He hears your prayer. So this is a great way to end this evening, is to know that your prayers can be effectual to God by confessing and repenting of any known sin. So why not take some time and walk through that, and pick back up with me when you're done. All right, well, I hope that's been a blessing to you. I hope you love Psalm 25 as much as I do. It really is a great psalm. Um, maybe there's one or two verses from it that you might want to commit to memory as just promises of God in your prayer life, or maybe in you need direction in your life, and it's just such a great reminder to know that God will lead us when we call on Him from a humble heart. And so, uh, again, I hope you're having a great week this week and um if there's anything maybe maybe the maybe you do have a big decision coming up and you just don't want to be the only one to pray about it you want someone else to pray for you about it let us let us know let someone else in your church family know let me know i'll be glad to uh, pray pray with you about that um i hope to see you this sunday as we worship king jesus at 9 30 a.m at cottondale baptist church in person or online if there's anything we can do for you in the meantime please let us know have a great rest of the week. God bless you.